Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar on the VAT changes to construction services, which are coming up on the 1st of March. I'm Sarah Barron, and I am a senior VAT manager at Menzies, and I look after our property and construction clients. Today, we'll be talking through some of the upcoming changes, and um, I've tried to include um, in the presentation as we go along, some of the questions that you've submitted in advance. Um, but feel free to use the, um, the chat function um, to submit any questions that you have as we go along. Um, to help me keep an eye on that today, I have Carol Hallam, who is um, all, one of our VAT managers, also in the, in the team here at Menzies, who also looks after property and construction clients. Um, so if we, if we spot any questions that we need to answer um, as we go along, then Carol will jump in and answer those. Otherwise, we'll run through them at the end. Um, if we run out of time or there are any that we need to do a bit, bit of specific um, research for you or, we, or you want us to come back offline, then we can come back to you separately. And the aim uh, this morning is to finish at 10.30. So just to check that everything's fully functioning and that there is somebody out there because I can't see you or hear you, uh, maybe in the chat function, you could um, give us a wave, let us know that you're there, um, let us know how much snow you've got on the ground and how far north you are. I'm on the south coast and the light dusting that was on the roof opposite is, is, is practically disappeared by now. So. Um, uh, we, we haven't got much left down here. So um, what are we going to cover this morning? Um, so I will run through the basic principles of what's changing, when, why, uh, and then more, more specifically what you need to do to implement the changes. Um, just to cover off one of the questions that I saw come in in advance, will there be another delay? Um, we're not expecting a delay. We are, we are anticipating that this will go ahead on the 1st of March. I did check the HMRC website this morning because I thought I might be quite hacked off having done all this preparation and got everybody together if they um, cancelled it this morning. Um, but there's nothing, there's nothing been announced so far that they're going to delay. That said, revenue are very stretched with their resources at the moment. And um, we would not be at all surprised. They've got Brexit to deal with. Um, they are expected to open the portal so that people can manage their um, deferred VAT payments. Um, I'm expecting that to open you know, within the next few days, really. Um, so revenue, they haven't really got the resources to deal with such a major change, but having delayed it twice already, I think it would be very difficult for them to do so again. That said, I wouldn't be surprised if we had something in two weeks time to say it wasn't it wasn't going to happen. So the purpose of the change um, is to reduce the amount of that that goes missing um, in, from the supply chain. Revenue reckon there's about a hundred million pounds that goes missing. Um, we're not quite sure how they how they calculate that, but um, they they. Um, have the, the right within that legislation, if they identify a particular type of supply chain um, where, where VAT tends to go missing, they can put in special um, regulations uh, to, to manage how the VAT is charged and reclaimed within that particular supply chain um, just to, to manage the amount of, of um, missing traders, how much that can potentially go missing in, in that field. So uh, the missing trader fraud, or, or it doesn't necessarily need to be um, a deliberate fraud, it could just be business failures. Um, 
takes advantage of the way that VAT flows through the supply chain. So um, a supplier, a, a subcontractor will do some work for a, a main contractor. Um, and VAT is an unusual tax. Um, normally, we each decide we all work, work out our own tax liabilities. Um, but VAT, it's your supplier that works out how much tax you've got to pay. So a supplier will do so a subcontractor will do some work for a main contractor, say a thousand pounds worth, and he'll say on that transaction you have to pay two hundred pounds of tax. So he'll issue his invoice to the main contractor, a thousand pounds plus that of two hundred. Main contractor pays that two hundred pounds to the subcontractor, and the subcontractor pays it off up to HMRC. And um, the, the, the bit that HMRC want to remove are the transactions where the main contractor pays the £200 to the subcontractor and he doesn't pay it to HMRC. That £200 has gone missing. Um, as I say, whether it's a deliberate fraud or that business has failed, uh, they, they, they reckon they're losing £100 million a year um, in situations like that. So in normal VAT accounting, um, the subcontractor would issue the invoice to the main contractor. They would pay the VAT. The main contractor would, would claim that VAT back from HMRC, raise their invoice to the end consumer, again charging VAT, collect that tax. Um, and it's, it flows all the way through the supply chain, no matter how many um, businesses are involved to get to the end consumer, the VAT is is added, charged and claimed all the way through until it sits finally with that, uh, that end user. So as I say, HMRC have the right if they've identified a supply chain where VAT is particularly at risk um, to change the way that, um, that the VAT is accounted for on transactions in that supply chain. And the way that they they change the, the, the focus of the VAT accounting is known as a reverse charge. Um, this, this type of reverse charge um, is referred to as a domestic reverse charge, um, which should not be read to imply that it has anything to do with homes, you know, households. It, for VAT purposes, when we talk about dom something domestic, um, that people are a bit special and we have our own language and we use domestic to mean anything within the UK. So the other types of reverse charge that you may have come across are if you've got cross-border supplies. Um, so um, a, a cross-border reverse charge um, is slightly different to, to how this reverse charge is, is um, accounted for. So we refer to it as the domestic reverse charge. So the purpose of using the reverse charge is to reduce the number of transactions um, where there's a, a cash flow of VAT. So if we can reduce the number of potential transactions where there's a cash flow of that from the customer to the supplier, um, and, and we reduce the number of transactions where that VAT can go missing. So when we use the um, reverse charge mechanism, um, the, uh, the supplier invoices their customer for the value of the work that they've done. And they tell the customer, instead of paying the VAT to me, you're going to pay it over to HMRC instead. So they, the, the invoice is issued. It's denoted to say that this is a reverse charge invoice. And instead of the supplier collecting the VAT and paying it off to HMRC, the recipient includes that output tax in their own VAT return, which if they didn't have any costs to claim, they would just pay it directly to HMRC. But because they've re re received the service as part of their um, business activities and they've got a valid VAT invoice to support it, um, the, the customer, the recipient of the service, can also claim back the input tax on the same, on the same return. 
and that leaves the, the recipient in a neutral cash flow situation. They haven't paid away any cash up to the supplier. They don't pay away any tax across to HMRC. They've claimed back the VAT on their costs. So there's no cash changed hands to, um, to account for the VAT in these transactions. So having established that the purpose of the, um, of the new regime is to cut down on the number of transactions, Revenue have identified that um, the construction industry is a supply chain that um, is, is liable to um, tax going missing. And they have set out that um, this, the reverse charge is going to apply to specified services in these particular supply chains. And the way that they've identified the supply chains that, the, that are affected is with these four criteria that we have listed here. So within scope for this um, reverse charge are construction services. So a construction service is, is as it says, it doesn't include labour only supplies. So if you are supplying, or if your customer is, your supplier is, is selling to you labour only services, they are not responsible for the construction that is undertaken by that labour, then that is not within the reverse charge regime. So it must be a construction service liable to that at five or 20%. This rules out the zero rated supplies. Obviously, if it's a zero rated supply, there's no cash that move changing hands. So there's no scope for it to go missing in the supply chain. So we don't need to change any of the accounting on reverse charge services. It needs to be. Um, so the wording in the legislation is that it's a payment which is required to be reported on a CIS return. I will put my hands up now and say I'm not a CIS expert, but we have a couple um, on, the, on the webinar this morning. So if you have any specific um, CIS questions, then um, either we'll be able to answer them at the end or we can come back to you later to help you out with those. Um, so it's a payment that is required to be reported on a CIS return. And both the supplier and the recipient must be registered for VAT. And having established all of these things, then we need to decide, is the recipient of the service? So is the customer an end user? And if they are not an end user, then it's within scope for the, for the domestic reverse charge. For these purposes, an end user and I'll go into more detail on this later, an end user who is someone who doesn't use the services to make an onward supply of construction services. So um, if you are buying in services, if you, you buy work in from a subcontractor and you are going to sell on to somebody else, you're going to sell construction services, you are not an end user, but your customer may be. So we'll look at each of those four points um, in a little bit more detail. Um, so if, if you fall within all of those criteria, so um, we'll use the example of a bricklayer, does work for a main contractor, um, and assuming that all parties are VAT registered and the, the work has to be reported on a CIS return, then this, this transaction here falls within the domestic reverse charge because our subcontractor, our bricklayer, is doing work for the main contractor and he knows that the main contractor is going to sell on construction services to his customer. So domestic reverse charge applies at this point. Bricklayer would not add that to his invoice. He raises his invoice for a thousand pounds, says this is a domestic reverse charge service. And then the customer, his, the main contractor would do the VAT accounting for the VAT on his service. The main contractor um, is 
selling his work to an office developer who isn't going to sell on any construction services. He's going to sell an office building. Um, so the end user here is this office developer. So the main contractor applies normal VAT accounting rules at this point. So a supply needs to be one of construction services. Um, we did have a question in, in advance um, asking whether repairs um, were included. Yes, they are. Yeah, any work uh, on a, a new or existing building which counts as construction um, is within the um, domestic reverse charge. Again, I'll, I'll restate it's not labour only supply, supplies. Um, this is uh, just a summary list that we, we've re um, recreated here. Um, there's a more detailed list in HMRC's guidance, and I've included a slide at the end of the presentation with some useful links, um, and, and there's a link included to the guidance, which includes the full lists of items which are specified as construction services. So it's construction of new buildings, um, installing systems into buildings. So if you install heating, lighting, air conditioning into a building, those are construction services. Um, but um, installing a security system uh, would not be within the construction services. Um, but then again, once the construction is completed, internal cleaning, um, painting and decorating and um, essential services in the, in the course of the construction, those are included within construction. And these are some of the things that aren't included. So if you are um, providing design services, so an architect or a surveyor, um, these, these aren't um, construction, even though it feeds into, you know, it, it allows the construction to take place and installing things like um, seating blinds and shutters, works of art. And if you manufacture building components off site to be delivered and installed, um, if you are just doing the manufacture off site, um, then that would not be a construction service. You might provide a mixture of services. So some things that fall fair and square onto those lists of um, construction, and then also something that's, that's included in that list as not a construction service. Um, and generally, if there's something that's a specified service, so something that's in those, that list of these are construction services, then you, you take the whole and it's all within the reverse charge package. There's a, there's a disregard if the specified services, so the construction services are less than 5% of the whole, then we can disregard that. Um, but generally, if there's, if there's a mixture of the two, so the example would be somebody who has a contract to design um, a heating system, if they just design it, that's not a construction service, that's not within the domestic reverse charge. If they design it, build it and install it, then they are making um, that, that installation brings the whole thing within the charge of the, the domestic reverse charge regime. And once you have decided that the work that you're doing on one particular site for the same customer is within the domestic reverse charge, you can, can assume that the whole project is going to be within, um, within that, um, that same regime. Goods are included. So um, our bricklayer again, he turns up to site with a pallet of bricks. Um, he doesn't need to split out the, the different elements on his invoice. So it's the goods together with the service. Um, they all fall into domestic reverse charge. 
and, and um, he would not charge VAT on any of that. So having decided that um, the, the work is a specified service and it does fall within the, the new accounting regime, then we need to look at the other items on that checklist. So um, is the customer um, CIS registered and is the payment required to be reported on a CIS return? Um, Obviously, HMRC, if we get this wrong, they're going to look to apply penalties. But the best defence against any penalties for getting anything wrong in VAT is to show that you've taken reasonable care. Um, so if your customer has told you that they're CIS registered, you check them on the verifier and you keep a copy of that verification, then you can show that you've taken reasonable care on that point. And similarly, the customer needs to be that registered. So if they tell you they're that number, um, you can go onto the HMRC website. It's a new VAT number um, checker that, that, um, that's been developed since um, the 1st of January. We're no longer able to access the old V's um, uh, VAT number verifier that was part, that's part of the EU. So there's a new version that's on the HMRC website. And again, I've included um, a link to that in our um, slide at the end with the useful links on it. So um, find out your customer's VAT number, you verify it using the checker and keep a copy of that verification on your file. You will need to show that VAT number. So your customer's VAT number goes on the invoice as well as your own and keep rechecking um, these items regularly. So if you're checking CIS numbers and checking VAT numbers for a, a continuing contract, then you need to make a judgment as to how frequently um, you need to recheck those. Um, in the case of um, cross-border services, HMRC say at least once a year is, is a good time, is a good time frame. Um, I would, um, if I was submitting a, a VAT return that was relying on using somebody's VAT number, I think I'd want to check it every quarter before I submit that return. So having checked that it's a specified service, we've checked the CIS status and we know that it needs to be reported on a CIS return and we have checked the VAT registration of the customer, then we need to know, is, are we supplying an end user? So we know that the definition in the legislation is that the recipient is um, somebody who does not make an onward supply of construction services. So if you're making, if you're supplying services to a private individual, they're an end user, um, somebody building a construction, uh, constructing a, an extension in a private home, they are supplying an end user, that's normal VAT accounting rules. If your customer is a property developer, so they are not going to sell on construction services, they are going to sell on a constructed building, they are an end user and businesses buying in services for their own needs. So again, they, they, they might be um, you know, building a new office that they're going to use. That again, they're, they're an end user and they are not selling on construction services. So um, the requirement is that your customer gives you written confirmation that they are an end user. And um, it is their responsibility to tell you that they're the end user. If they don't give you that confirmation in writing, then HMRC say that you apply the reverse charge. So you, you wouldn't charge them VAT on, their, on your invoice to them. There is a slight risk inherent in this because if you don't charge VAT when you should have done, then it's you that could be liable for um, an assessment from HMRC. 
So mistakes happen and it could be that a, a confirmation was overlooked. Um, so uh, um, when we're, we're setting up, when we're entering into new contracts, we need to consider does the contract, if I fail to charge VAT and it later becomes apparent that I should have done, does the contract give me the right to go back and invoice additionally for that VAT? And if the reason why I didn't issue that invoice with VAT was not my fault, it was the customer's fault, I wouldn't want to be liable for any penalties or interest that HMRC may, may charge on that. So does the contract contain warranties to say that if, if the error in VAT charging is due to the customer's responsibility, then they will pay penalties and interest if they arise. So there are situations where the end user, that they, they step back one place in the supply chain. Um, and that might be where um, the, the end user and the main contractor are connected. Um, and for these purposes, we mean somebody who's in the same corporate group, or it could be that they both hold a relevant interest in, in the land in question, so a landlord and tenant. Um, so if if um, so in the situation, say, where um, Tesco are building a, a new um, store somewhere, I would expect that Tesco have a building services company, a captive subsidiary that, that undertakes all their construction projects. Um, they, are, they would be in the same group as Tesco Retail, who are actually going to run the shop once it's constructed. So um, main contractor and end user in the same corporate group, then the end user position steps back one to, to this transaction here. So our subcontractor is um, going to charge that as normal on that transaction. So we've worked through the, um, the criteria for whether the domestic reverse charge applies. And this is the flowchart that HMRC have included in, in their guidance. Um, so uh, just to recap, so the first question is, is this a supply of um, labour only? Uh, and if it is, then the domestic reverse charge doesn't apply, so your labour provider will charge you VAT. I'll come back to that point um, in a, on a future slide. Um, and then we work through each of these questions in turn. So does the supply fall within the scope of CIS? Yes. Um, is the supply standard or reduced rate for VAT? Is the customer VAT registered? And if at any stage the answer to any of these questions is no, then we just apply normal VAT accounting. But assuming that the customer is VAT registered, you've checked your customer's CIS status. And finally, has the customer provided that written confirmation that they're an end user? If the answer at that stage is no, then we use domestic reverse charge VAT accounting. And there are some things just to just as a reminder that are not within domestic reverse charge. So payments that aren't required to be reported in CIS, if either party isn't VAT registered, again, we can ignore it for zero rated supplies. And if the end user has, if the customer has said that they're an end user. So having established all of those things, um, and we're happy that, yes, it, it does fall within the domestic reverse charge, um, we need to think about when we're going to apply this from. So the rules change with effect from the 1st of March, unless revenue change their minds again. Um, and 
uh, we are looking, so the, the trigger point that we take, that we take um, is the point, it's the tax point. So for that purposes, when we talk, talk about a tax point, um, we are looking at the issue of uh, a VAT invoice. So that's not an application for payment, that would be a VAT invoice or the receipt of a payment. So if um, work is performed in February 2021 um, and either an, a VAT invoice or a payment is received after the 1st of March for that work, that falls within the domestic reverse charge. Oh, did I skip to there? Yes. Um, so if it falls and we have to report it using um, domestic reverse charge, um, then we need to make sure we record our processes. So going back again, we need to be happy that we've taken reasonable care to get everything right. So we need a record of the verification checks that have been undertaken of VAT numbers and CIS status. And we need to um, understand how we're going to keep um, a, a record of those end user confirmations. Um, and then there will be changes to how invoices are raised and what our VAT returns look like. So this is the example invoice that Revenue have issued with their guidance. Um, so it's slightly different to how a normal VAT accounting invoice looks. So, you know, as normal, we've got the supplier's VAT registration number, but now we're going to also show the customer's VAT registration number, showing the normal invoice number, a unique number and, um, and the invoice date. And then also, We've got just a little wording to flag at the bottom that this is a reverse charge invoice. We have, um, there's, there's no set wording that has to be used. Um, there's a couple of different examples given in um, HMRC's guidance, um, one or two of them quoting the section number of the VAT Act that, that this falls under. Um, uh, I don't expect anybody but Carol and I to remember VAT Act reference, reference sections. Um, so, but um, yeah, so you need to state that the customer is liable to account for the VAT using the re, um, reverse charge on this invoice. And on the face of the invoice, you need to state the VAT rate. So you see on this one, we've got um, two different VAT rates applying. So you give the value at each and each rate that's applicable, but you do not show feeding into the amount that's payable, the VAT that's actually due for this service. Um, in the legislation, it says that the ideal situation is to include on the face of the invoice the amount of VAT that's accountable on this on this supply. Um, I think it's quite might be quite difficult to get accounting systems set up to do that. So the legislation does give you the option rather than showing the actual amount of VAT chargeable um, of just showing the VAT rates. And I think the fact that HMRC have used an example that just shows the VAT rates rather than the amount of VAT charged um, is, indicates that they're happy to accept invoices like that. But the key issue is you must not show um, an amount of VAT that feeds into the amount of pay uh, that's payable by the customer. So we, have, as the supplier, have raised this reverse charge invoice on our VAT return. The only entry that we need to show on the VAT return is the net sale, and that would go into box six. So we haven't got any output tax to go into box one. Um, we're just showing, as the supplier, we're just showing the net sale in, in box six of the return. 
if that was the only transaction, there'd be nothing to pay to revenue, um, and it would it would essentially be a nil return. If we are the recipient of the service, we've been told by the supplier on our invoice that we have to account for the VAT on the value of the work that he's done for us. So that goes into box one. So the VAT that's due on the invoice that we've received goes into box one of our VAT return. And as we've received that service as um, part of our business activities and, and assuming that we are fully taxable, we don't have any exempt supplies, we're entitled to claim back all of the VAT on that cost in box four. So if those were the only transactions, box five would come out at nil. So it's cash neutral for our recipient. As we've made a, a purchase, the net amount of that goes into box seven. And um, for this type of, domestic, of reverse charge, the net amount does not go into box six. Um, I mentioned earlier that there are other types of reverse charge. Um, so for a cross-border um, purchase, the, the net amount would also go into box six of your VAT return. So um, there was a question about um, how zero and other accounting packages were going to be um, able to cope with, whether they were going to be able to cope with um, putting the amounts into the right boxes for VAT returns. Um, yes, but you need to identify the right reverse charge VAT code that's been set up on your system to make sure that it includes that the, the um, figures go into boxes one, four, and seven on the return, but not box six. That would only be if you're buying in services cross border. So how to put together our VAT return. I think the biggest issue that most people are concerned about is the cash flow. And um, all, all we can do is be aware that this change is going to change, is going to affect cash flow. Um, we, we can minimize any delays in being paid by our um, customers by, you know, making sure we're absolutely certain and it's clear to them why we've applied a particular VAT treatment to an invoice, just to cut down on queries and, and any delays um, getting into the payment system. And um, potentially, you know, if you need to agree that in advance, if you, if you say to them from the 1st of March, right, this is going to be the treatment, this is why I'm applying reverse charge, and then you can iron out any questions um, before the invoices actually start flowing to them. If you finish up um, doing repayment back returns, which may well be the case, submit them as soon as possible and consider going on to monthly back returns, which you're entitled to do if they are mostly going to be repayment returns. Um, so once you have, once you start submitting repayment back returns, you need to be ex ready to explain to revenue why um, the pattern of your returns has changed. And um, we would expect them to do verification checks before they'll release repayments. So the questions that they will ask when doing a repayment are, you know, why, why are you suddenly in a repayment situation? We can explain that, domestic reverse charge. And they will want to see samples of your biggest purchase invoices. Now, stepping off the issue of the domestic reverse charge, anybody um, in the construction industry who is using labour providers needs to be aware and needs to be applying the due diligence which HMRC expect you to apply to check on your labour providers. They are very concerned about um, that going missing in the labour provider market. They've seen a lot of businesses phoenixing. So they'll, you know, the same, the same directors will set up a business, they'll run up a big VAT debt, they'll disappear, set up again with a different name. 
and they are really keen to make sure that the customers, the people that buy in labour, are checking that the, the businesses are, that, that are providing the labour are well run, they're not running up that debt, um, and they're not you know, going to disappear in six months and leave a big debt behind. Um, so again, on that um, slide where I've included some links to some useful information, I've included links to the due diligence that HMRC expect you to undertake if you're buying in services from a labour provider. If your VAT return now becomes a repayment return, it's likely if you are buying in services from a labour provider, they're going to be charging you VAT. It's quite likely that they are going to be some of those biggest purchase invoices that you need to show to HMRC. And they will also want to see the due diligence that you've undertaken um, to make sure that those, that those suppliers are legitimate and are running their business um, uh, in a legitimate manner. So, so please do check out what those what those that due diligence they expect uh, you to undertake is. And um, we need to make sure. So HMRC have said that they are going to apply a light touch. So mistakes happen. We're all getting used to um, a whole new world of um, domestic reverse charge. We're also all getting used to a whole new world world of Brexit regulations. So. Um, lots of learning taking place at the moment and revenue have said that for six months they'll take a light touch if errors are made um, and um, but they they expect you to try you can't just ignore it and hope it will go away they will they will you know give you a break if you can show that you've made an effort to get it right um, but yeah we, we you need Six months in, you need to be used to doing these correctly and able to show the records and to show that you've taken reasonable care in, in your VAT accounting. And the records that you maintain um, need to comply still with um, making tax digital. So um, you can't make a manual adjustment. You, know, you can't raise an invoice as you would normally do cross through the VAT cross out the amount that goes into box one of your return and, and um, do it that way. You've got to make sure that um, your records that you are um, uh, making are compliant with um, the making tax digital regu regulations. So inevitably, um, there are risks if we get this wrong. Um, so from a supplier's perspective, if you apply the, the reverse charge, so you don't charge VAT on your invoice and it becomes clear later that you should have done, it's you as the supplier, you're liable for an assessment from HMRC. Um, so um, you know, HMRC will expect you to pay that to them does your contract include sufficient warranties to ensure that um, you can collect the VAT that you should have charged from your customer? And again, has it got in those suitable indemnities um, against penalties and interest? Um, also, you know, if, if invoices aren't agreed in advance, there's delays to payment if, if um, invoices are queried um, so if you're stating, the, if you're going to be charging VAT, um, you need to state on your invoice or in correspondence with your customer why it is you're charging VAT. And from the customer's perspective, if you receive an invoice which charges VAT when it shouldn't have done, um, you're not actually entitled to recover VAT that's charged in error on your VAT return. So you would have to collect that. You'd have to go back for a refund from the supplier. And if the invoice that came in from your customer, from your supplier, sorry, um, 
should have been a reverse charge invoice, you are required to put the VAT on your VAT return. If it, if it should be a domestic reverse charge invoice, even if the customer's charged you VAT, you should really have put that VAT on your VAT return to pay over to HMRC as well. So not only have you paid the VAT to your supplier, but you should have put it into box one of your return and paid it up to HMRC. So you could finish up with a with a double whammy on the VAT there. So um, you know again, you need to have robust procedures in place to check you know, why are you being charged VAT. Is it legitimate that you're being charged VAT? Um, and make sure you're you're happy with that before you pay that that VAT over to your supplier. But if you've taken reasonable care and you can show that that's the case, then that is a defence against any um, assessment, penalties, interest that revenue um, may try to, to raise. So in getting ready for this, um, we need to understand the rules and hopefully this morning we'll go a little way towards helping you to do that and make sure that um, the staff that are actually processing and raising invoices and preparing VAT returns are comfortable with what they need to be doing. Um, you need to have your internal procedures up to date and, and the risk management processes reviewed to make sure that they can take account of the new regulations. And you need to talk to your customers and suppliers where you've got contracts that that span the 1st of March, um, you know, and, and work out how you're going to apply that cut off so that everybody's clear and, and we minimise the number of queries that arise. And again, we need to make sure that the records are, are compliant and also they work um, under making tax digital. So as promised, these are the useful links um, that take you through um, to a bit more information. So we've got that new uh, VAT number checker system that's on HMRC's website. And this one is the basic guidance that HMRC have issued. And then the slightly more technical in-depth guidance as well. And here, this is the link that takes us to the due diligence that HMRC will expect you to have undertaken if you are using labour providers before you claim any VAT on their invoices. So that was um, a necessarily quick canter through the, the changes that are coming up. Um, I could see the, uh, the chat function flashing away. It looks like we've got quite a few questions. So if I can hand over to Carol. Um, do you want to pick some of those up, Carol? Hello, yes, I need to unmute myself before talking, I think. Um, yes, I will run a few uh, of the questions. Some of them we'll probably have to um, include in our FAQs um, following the presentation. So the first one I'm looking at is whether landlords and who build um, people who, sorry, an entity which is a landlord but also builds properties and employs subcontractors, and whether end users as well as main contractors, depending on which what property it is. So you would have to look on a pro pro project by project basis. So for the supplies you receive as an end user, you would notify your supplier and ensure that that is charged. Where you are not an end user, um, then the DRC would apply as normal. Yeah, so, so you'd, look, you'd look project by project. So if you've got a mixture, of some work where you are the end user and others where you're you're not, then you'd notify the customers, the suppliers um, individually on each project, wouldn't you? Yes. And uh, another question was whether it's necessary to ask for an end user letter, even if the status is obvious. And yes, you should ask for uh, get a copy of notification. It can be by post, by email, or even included in the contract that you have with that customer, but the notification should be held with your VAT records. Yeah, yeah. This guidance specifically says written notification. 
Um, so I've just seen some more queries pop up, but let me look at the other ones that I've just um, briefly considered earlier. Um, I will have to check the position on IT and audio visual services unless there are you um, know what the position would be, whether it falls within DRC. Let's say that again, sorry. Whether IT and audio visual services fall within DRC. I'd need to check that yeah. one. Mm. I think cause it's, cause it's quite a um, grey yeah. area. In terms of uh, self-billing, um, yes. we would expect the usual VAT invoice details, the usual self-billing VAT invoice details to be on there in addition to the new DRC wordings and VAT treatment that you would show on the invoice. There are some transitional rules for self-billing, but we can cover that in detail if it's required. Yes, I know we do have some clients who do self-billing, so we can include some, some um, more detail um, in our FAQs. Okay, okay. Um, the next one would be, there's a question asking whether roof uh, supplying labour and materials um, to a developer working for a private individual, um, whether the DRC would apply. Um, it depends on whether the developer is the um, making on the supply of construction services, although if it's providing, sorry, my thing's just gone one second. Yeah, if they are, if they're providing services to, so if the developer is going to sell a completed house to their customer, then the developer is the end end user. So that the, the invoice to the developer would be normal VAT accounting. Okie dokie. So I'm just moving on. So I skipped down those questions. Um, There's a question here. I'm not sure it's wholly to do with DRC. Um, the new house builder acts as main contractor, but the subcontractor has been um, providing labour and materials but, and have been charged VAT by their suppliers. But I'm not sure if that's con um, whether it's by their subcontractors or not. Um, but I think we may need a bit more detail on that um, if possible. Sorry, so I'm, just can... looking at this, I'm looking at the snow reports here um, and, and the, the conclusion is we've got plenty in London, but none, none as far away as Taunton yet. I think you're a bit too far west in Taunton. <laughs> But, um, yeah, so so that, that was a question from Derek. I think we might need a bit more information, but generally, if you're constructing, say, a new build, I don't have enough detail there. Just if it's a qualifying new build, um, so it's zero rated and all the conditions are met, I would expect the suppliers, the subcontractors further down the line to um, the VAT liability of their supplies to follow the zero rating as well. Um, but I think it might be useful if we just get a bit more detail to have a better understanding so we can confirm the position, um, mm -hmm. if that's possible. Yeah. But generally, there's oh, sorry, there's another question from um, Derek. Um, if, say, so for example, that has been incorrectly charged, it cannot be reclaimed by the customer. Um, HMRC would not... Uh, would probably query the position and um, and whether that has been correctly charged and at that point disallow any fact that has been claimed. So I'm just looking at um, any other questions we've got coming in. Um, so we've got one, um, who should be sending letters prior to any switch, the subcontractor or the main contractor? I think it needs to be a two-way conversation. Um, so the subcontractor would need to understand what the main contractor's onward supply is. Um, and, and similarly, the main contractor, if they can tell the subcontractor that they're not an end user, um, then that would be a useful conversation to have. Um, we've got site managers providing a labor only service. Um, so, um, if you are just, if you're a, if you're providing like a, a, um, a construction um, supervision service, you're not actually providing any construction service that would not be subject to domestic reverse charge. If you're supplying um, a supervision and 
um, you're also responsible for the work that's undertaken, then that that would, but it need it would we'd need to understand really precisely what service is being supplied to decide whether it falls within those things that are not specified construction services, so more of a professional service, or whether you're responsible for the underlying construction work that's being supplied. Um, will zero be adapted? Hopefully I've answered that one, um, but we do have a couple of our um, systems advisory team on the, on the webinar today. Um, so if you had any of that, that's a question from Karen Smith. Um, if you've got any specific queries, I think we can direct those to our systems advisory guys and they can help. Um, if you are uh, having a property built to rent out, then you are not providing, if your, your supply is not <coughs> A construction service, um, so you would be the end user. So it, the reverse charge wouldn't apply. You'd pay that on your invoices. You got any others, Carol? I'm just flicking through um, the questions. Uh, I've gone down to the bottom. Um, so I've got one here. If the end user is a homeowner, not CIS or VAT registered. That would fall under normal VAT invoicing. You charge them VAT um, if it was um, standard or reduced rate service. Uh, so we have a similar question in the Q and A, um, and it's a property investment company, and they've confirmed they are end users. Um, in that case, DRC would not apply, and we expect that to be charged. That's very similar to the question that Sarah just answered, um, as well. Um, so I'm conscious of the time. We have three minutes. So as a contractor, if I supply materials, but my subcontractor supplies labour only, does he charge me VAT? So um, he, your subcontractor sub presumably is, um, is supplying a construction service. Um, so uh, even if you give him the materials to use to provide that service, um, so I think I think we've, we've got a question now. It's a roofer. So if you're if you provide the roof tiles, but you've got a specialised person who comes on site and provides you services of um, of building the roof, and he has some responsibility for the work that he's undertaking, then that would be a specified service, and that would fall under the reverse charge and am I charging onto an end user um, you would charge that to your end user we've got any others that we need to pick up now I think it would just be um, if you have any specific questions or we've not picked up anything here um, do feel free to get in touch with either myself or Carol um, if you don't have our direct email contacts, then please um, get in touch with us through um, our marketing team who sent you the, um, the link to get onto the Zoom call this morning. Um, so any specific questions that we haven't been able to pick up, please do get in touch and, and we'll look into those and get back to you. Um, yeah. Carol, anything further? No, I think that's fine. Um, there are some... I realise further up there's some in questions received in between in the chat um just received what we can do is perhaps cover them in the faqs um mm -hmm. so it's things like if the end user doesn't provide notification and what the billing what the invoicing position would be even though you know they are an end user so we can cover things like that off in the faqs um but i think we're fast running out of time yeah there's some questions coming in about whether the the slides and the recording Oh yes, I believe the recording will be available for posterity. Please don't judge me. Brilliant. Well, before we finish, we actually have an exit poll just to cover off to understand if you have any topics you would like to um, have further details on. And I'm going to launch the poll and if you could 
selective as any of these topics which would uh, you'd like more de uh, more information on. Okay. Here we go. Oh, apparently we can't vote. Oh, I had some questions about other. So hopefully that's been useful to you. Thank you for your um, keeping the questions coming in. Um, it's good to know that there's somebody actually out there on the other side listening and I'm not waffling to myself for an hour about VAT, although I don't mind doing that. We got answers in on the on the poll there, Carol. Yes, we have, and it looks like it's slowed down. It's stopped. Brilliant. Yep, that's great. All right then. Okay. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you then. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye.